I'm Kristen, and this is the Explorer in You podcast. Now, what I've discovered after visiting five continents and some amazing places is that the greatest thing standing in your way of seeing the world is what you believe is possible. I believe that travel is for everyone on any budget, and it doesn't have to be overwhelming. So this podcast is all about unlocking the Explorer in you. You'll hear stories from people who will inspire you to set big travel goals and show you how to achieve them. Let's explore. Hey there, welcome back to the Explorer in You podcast. So if you haven't noticed, I took a pause from recording the show. After 10 episodes, it just felt like the right time to take a step back, recharge and reflect on the experience. I really wanted to think about what I'd learned, what worked, what didn't, how can I improve, and to make sure that I'm still in alignment with my goals and my values. One of the things I realized is that I really love talking with people about travel and how important it is to me to continue to amplify diverse perspectives in the travel industry. It's one of the ways that I'm able to help make travel feel accessible for everyone. So I'm excited to be back with all new episodes. But before I get into what this episode is about, let me share a few changes with you. So first, I've revamped my promotional graphics with a slightly new look, which I love. And you can check that out on my social channels. And when they pop up, feel free to share them in your stories and tag me. Second, So I used to end my show by asking all my guests the same question, what their most meaningful travel experience is. Now, I still love that question and I've gotten some really great responses, but for this season of episodes, I wanted to change it up a bit. So I'm asking people to tell me about a travel experience that brought them joy. So why am I changing the question? Well, this has been a rough year. I think we can all agree on that. And... I think it's important to find ways to infuse joy into our lives. And this felt like the perfect opportunity to do that. So I've gotten some great stories from my guests and I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. Okay, so the biggest announcement that I'm super excited to share with you is that you can now purchase Explorer in You swag. So think t-shirts, totes, journals, I seriously love everything in the store. So you can shop the store at explorerinyou.com forward slash shop. And I've selected a few of my favorites. You can see them there. But if you enjoy what this show has to offer, you can really support it by buying some of these super cute pieces. And your support really means so much to me. So let's talk about today's show. So I'm sure many of you are thinking about your travel plans for the end of this year and and maybe even looking ahead to what travel will look like in 2021. My guest, Amy Dreheim, is the founder of ABD Creative, a marketing agency specializing in hospitality, and she's sharing her insights on the trends that will be shaping travel for the end of this year and into next year. Amy works with travel, hospitality, and lifestyle clients on marketing strategies. And she also hosts her own podcast, How to Share, where she talks to industry leaders about the future of travel. It's funny, Amy and I have very similar trajectories. We were both English majors and minored in our history. We both chose career paths in marketing and communications. And we both started our podcast this year with the goal of amplifying diverse voices. So not only did I feel like I was talking to a kindred spirit, I also really appreciated how open and thoughtful Amy was in our conversation. We talk about so much in this episode, like how hotels have pivoted due to COVID, how to build more inclusive travel experiences, significant changes to travel in 2021, what buzzwords you're going to want to pay attention to, and so much more. I learned a lot from my conversation with Amy, and I know you will too. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. 
I wanted to start off with um, hearing a little bit about you and if you could tell us a little bit about your business and how you started working with the hospitality and travel industry. Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, we'll start at the beginning. I was born and raised in upstate New York. Um, I went to school in Montreal. I went to McGill University and I studied English and art history. Um, and Same then, here. <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, so we have that in common. Um, and with an English and an art history major, it's not entirely clear what you'll end up doing. Right. Um, for me, that was booking a one-way ticket to Los Angeles, California, sight unseen, um, and trying to pursue a career in the arts, whether it was becoming an actress or being a writer. And writing really took off for me. Um, so I actually published a novel um, when I was 25. And wow. I won't, yeah, <laughs> pretty exciting, very different from what I do today. Um, but after publishing the book, um, I, uh, I shortly after that got into marketing, actually. So marketing for me was a place where I could use my talent as a writer um, and have, you know, a full-time career, basically. I worked for a marketing technology company that built websites for um, certain verticals like senior living, student housing, self-storage. It wasn't very sexy, right? It's like not mm -hmm. the uh, most exciting realm, but it was sort of a foot into the door of hospitality. So that student housing sector, I think, um, sort of was a nice segue for, for me. And when I had the opportunity to trade uh, those verticals for like steaks and spas and hotels and restaurants, um, you know, I jumped in feet first. So I've been working with hotels, doing marketing for the last eight years. And um, about five years in, I left um, sort of climbing the corporate world with one hotel group for um, the opportunity to do it myself. And so I started my own business, ABD Creative, which is a hotel marketing uh, consulting firm. And now I have a portfolio of several different hotels, restaurants, uh, resorts all across the US, and even one in Belize now. So it's pretty exciting. That's very exciting. Um... I mean, I haven't been to Belize, but I hear it's a great place to visit. Yeah, it's beautiful. I actually honeymooned at this place. And then now years later, I'm, I'm working with them. So it's oh, pretty cool. Oh, how fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you you really do work with like hotels and, and you're really part of this industry. So I thought that um, you'd be a great person to ask what trends you see shaping the last few months of 2020. Oh, yeah, I would love to. I love this stuff. So um, so there's four trends that I have really noticed, and I can kind of talk through them with you. Um, for the first big trend that I'm seeing that sort of kicked off this summer and is continuing and will even continue into the next year, and hopefully beyond that, is adventure travel and ecotourism. So I think I see those two categories as going really hand in hand. So when we talk mm -hmm. about adventure travel, we're talking about off the beaten path. We're talking about um, people going and glamping or camping in tents and having outdoor experiences. This is really big right now because as we know, um, people aren't jumping on planes right now to travel across the world, but they are exploring the national parks and even closer to home, they're exploring what's in their own backyard. Um, and so adventure travel, I think is a big one and ecotourism I think is a, is a big part of that, especially with everything happening. Um, when we went into lockdown and animals started sort of like emerging from their dens for the first time, mm -hmm. people started to think about the impact of their travel. And um, those two sectors, adventure travel and ecotourism are ways to make a smaller imprint, but um, those trips will still have a big impact on you as a traveler, if that makes sense. Right. So I think those are big. And then when we talk about hotels, we also have to talk about group business because that's typically about half of the business that hotels bring in, right? So you're right. traveling um, as a tourist, but then there's also the group side. So on the group side, we're seeing a lot more um, micro meetings, micro events, um, and that's just, that goes for weddings as well. So people who had 
big conferences, big weddings planned for the spring. Of course, those events were unfortunately postponed or canceled. And now we're seeing people start to um, have interest in booking smaller meetings and events, um, elopement type weddings, where it's just a few family members or just the bride and groom. Um, and this is the type of group business that we're going to see through year end and, and into next year, I think until um, we have a vaccine, I don't think that we will be gathering in the same, um, in the same ways that we did pre COVID. And then, um, so a couple more, um, I talk about the hotel vacation rental hybrid. And what I mean by this, I mean, it's, it starts with these cleaning protocols. So, so now hotels are rolling out these hospital grade cleaning protocols, um, the EPA rated cleaning products. Um, and so along with that is, is reassurance for a customer that if I stay in a hotel, chances are I'm gonna be safe. But in a hotel, there's this problem of long hallways, elevators, um, being sort of packed in. And so some people, instead of staying in a hotel, would choose a vacation rental because they have their own space, they have their own door, their own key, um, maybe their own backyard, their own kitchen. Um, and so that's also appealing. So I think what, what is most interesting, how do you get the best of both? It's a hotel vacation rental hybrid. So it's the comforts of a vacation rental, but it's sort of the reassurances and protocols of a hotel. So properties that are set up for that, like cabins inside of a resort, like we have one here in Bend, it's called Brasada Ranch. Those are just like ideal. That's what travelers are gonna be seeking out. And then, the last one, which I think I touched on at the beginning, um, when we talked about adventure travel, road trips and staycations, I think are a big part of that. So really just traveling um, within your own backyard, not needing to go too far, but having the ability to get a, a change of scenery and have a change of pace. And I can see that, you know, definitely people not wanting to hop on a plane and go too far and sort of deal with the whole, you know, having to get tested and then worrying about, okay, how long you know, being trapped on a plane, like how, how much is that going to, you know, up my chances of getting COVID. Um, so I can see that be, being really um, appealing is just staying local. And then um, adventure travel, I mean, people still want to have great experiences and sort of those epic experiences. Um, so I can definitely see how, you know, having an adventure, something big. Fortunately, in the U.S., I mean, we have so many beautiful, like, national parks and places to have those types of experiences. You definitely can see why those are going to continue to be trends for the end of the year and, and going into 2021. Mm -hmm. Have you seen um, hotels pivot because of COVID-19? Um, how do you see hotels making adjustments and trying to accommodate their guests. I know you mentioned more cleaning protocols, but are there other ways that um, you see hotels sort of evolving? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge, I think. Every hotel is different. Every destination is different. Um, but I will say that when you look at boutique hotels and independent hotels, they're sort of uniquely set up to be able to pivot and adapt um, in some really cool ways. So boutique and independent hotels, I'm talking about smaller properties, a hundred rooms or less typically. And those hotels have always relied on creating guest experiences to sort of set them apart. And so in, in the wake of COVID-19, these guys are sort of they're built for it. They're built to adapt. And so mm. I'll, I'll give you an example of what one has done. So I have a property in San, in uh, San Francisco. And um, at the start of the pandemic, they had to shut down a lot of their outlets, right? They had to shut down their fitness center. They had to shut down their cafe. Mm -hmm. And as you know, San Francisco has just um, recently sort of opened their gates to tourism again. Mm -hmm. So officially now tourists are welcome to come back. The destination is promoting itself again. Um, and so the property, you know, had a little bit of a dilemma because the fitness center is still closed and the cafe is still closed. So what we did is um, 
we invited guests, number one, if they want to work out, to go out and explore all the trails and parks in and around San Francisco where you can have a great workout and also get a great view. So we did a curated list of hiking trails and running trails. And then on top of that, at the hotel, they actually took some Peloton bikes from their fitness center and popped them into some of their larger King guest rooms. So now we have a King Peloton room where travelers who really need to stay fit um, can book one of those rooms and have their own personal Peloton whenever they, you know, have time to work out during their stay. So those wow. are some cool ways, yeah, that hotels can pivot right now. Yeah, it seems like it's almost an opportunity for a more customized experience. Yes. Yes. Personalization. You know, we've been talking about this for years, but it is so, um, it's so important right now. And it seems like this, our current circumstances has just kind of pushed us, you know, to, to get there even faster, I think, um, than yeah. maybe normally we would. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's, that's really, um, interesting. And then, so, Social injustice and climate change, I mean, they're two huge issues that, you know, are in everyone's minds today. And how do you see that shaping the way we travel moving forward? I know you mentioned ecotourism, um, you know, there's how do we create a more inclusive travel industry? Um, there's also cause-based itineraries. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I love this. This is like my favorite stuff. <laughs> so. Well, I think this is really interesting. These are good things that have come out of a really challenging time. Um, so I see these, I see, you know, social uh, social issues, like being able to be a voice, like for hotels to actually step up and make a statement is really, it's, there's an opportunity there. And then, um, and when it comes to obviously climate change, um, where you and I both are, we've dealt with some terrible wildfires. So that's a big one too. How do, how do these things play out at the hotel level? When we talk about social issues, I, I can see how cause-based itineraries could be um, really interesting and something that travelers might seek out. So, you know, in the past, maybe you go to um, San Francisco and you take a walking tour of all the major attractions or you hop on that trolley um, and you get to, you know, go by the Golden Gate Bridge, go through Union Square. Um, now I think there's an opportunity to create itineraries that go even deeper. Like let's mm. take travelers into the Mission District. Let's show them, you know, where tortillas are handmade every day. Let's meet the families and let's have the families tell their stories instead of us telling them. Right. And for some of our listeners who might not be as familiar with San Francisco, um, the Mission District is predominantly a Latinx community. And I think it's been a little bit gentrified over the years, but it still has that same community at its heart. Would you agree? Yes. Yes. And it, so that's the thing, right? It's about peeling back the layers. We're not going to have, for lack of a better word, it's like, we're not, it's not going to be our whitewashed interpretation of it. Right. And that's sort of where we stood before, not to put blame on anyone. Um, but now we have the opportunity and we realize the need to let people tell their own stories, give people in our community a voice, let them use their own voice to share what they do, what they love, share their culture with us. So I think um, as a culture in general, we're more open and um, um, like our ears are open to these stories. We want to have these real experiences. The bucket list itineraries. It's like, that's a thing of the past. We're not going to be traveling to destinations to go stand in line and wait for a tourist trap type experience. We want to go deeper. Right. And I, I think like authenticity has always popped up in the travel industry. Like I want an authentic experience, but I feel like now in this climate, like that has a more honest meaning to it than maybe it has in the past. Yeah. The authenticity is a, um, that's like a troublesome word, right? A, a lot of people stick that on there. Like we are authentic, like mm -hmm. you're authentically what, right. Um, and so now we're, you're right. We're starting to really understand 
what that word can mean and the power of a truly authentic experience. That's not just a buzzword. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Which is exciting. It's it's very, like you said, there are so many opportunities now and there's such a um, uh, desire for it that I think those two things just creates an exciting time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about inclusivity, there's there's, you know, a few things that I can point to, but I think, um, I have a podcast too. I know we'll probably mention that later, but I, I did have the opportunity to interview Damon Lawrence, who is the founder of the first hotel group dedicated to black travelers. And, um, uh, that was a really, really interesting conversation. So he started, um, homage hospitality, um, a few years ago. But with the Black Lives Matter movement um, that's recently sort of reasserted itself and taken hold again, I think as of May and June, there's so much more interest in what Damon is doing. And now Damon has this platform and this opportunity, um, and he's looking at developing maybe 10 hotels here in the next few years that will um, basically take care of the most marginalized group. And what Mm. he learned from his first iteration, which was the Moore Hotel in New Orleans, is that if you build something for um, the most marginalized, you actually build something for everyone. And he had huge success sort of launching to an audience that would, that, um, or sort of focusing on a demographic that was really black travelers who hadn't really been spoken to before. And in doing that, he actually created a space where everyone felt welcome, where everyone was comfortable, where the amenities in the bathroom um, like worked for everybody's hair and everybody's mm-hmm. skin by create by choosing and curating an experience and products that were built for black travelers. So that's a great example of inclusivity in this industry and how powerful it can be by creating spaces that are truly welcoming. That is a great example of um, a hotel. Is it, is it a small chain? It's like boutique hotel? Homage Hospitality is the hotel group. And okay. so he had, so he opened with one property in New Orleans and he sold that property, um, but he has a few more properties in the works. And I think uh, we'll hear more about those soon. Okay. That's super exciting. Thanks for um, sharing that. And I did see that you had had that conversation with him. I'm sure it was had a ton of insights um, on this topic. So as far as being inclusive, how do you think the hospitality and travel industry can become even more inclusive? Um, Gosh, it's a, that's a huge, huge, huge question. Um, I guess I'll point to another conversation that I had recently um, with Joey Hamilton, who is a brand strategist. Um, So Joey talked about, you know, the first thing that we can do in the hospitality and travel industry is to actually be the voice for people that aren't in the room. So this industry is, to be frank, a lot of like white men and a lot of familial wealth. That's what you see when you look across um, hotel ownership. And so if these hotel owners and management companies um, feel strongly that they want to be more inclusive, they can't overnight suddenly have a board that, that reflects, you know, different people than what it has, right? Um, But they can begin to be the voice for people not in the room. And when they have the opportunities to hire, they can hire a more diverse team. But it really starts with speaking up and having conversations that are usually pretty awkward at first, but are worth having so that you know that your employees um, uh, share that same mindset. If you believe that the industry needs to become more inclusive, it's time to start having those conversations. I know that is a big question. So thank you for giving me such a thoughtful answer. And I think what I, I hear you saying is that it's, you know, first about acknowledging there's a problem and acknowledging how much representation matters, like in board situations. I think even in, across the board in the travel industry, like if you think about who are the editors at travel magazines, mm-hmm. you know, what different types of people are we seeing, you know, in marketing materials, you know, are we seeing different types of people that represent the spectrum of people who travel? And then also, I think kind of what I hear you're saying too, is that 
it's about using your privilege to help those that have been sort of historically not represented or marginalized. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to put it. Absolutely. So, hey, like, <laughs> I mean, gosh, there's so much we could say on this topic, but yes. Yeah, it's his own podcast, right? <laughs> yeah. If you are a hotel owner, <laughs> look at your privilege. It's exactly right. Like, how did you get there? And if you, you know, what's your story? Is it a story of, um, is it bootstrapped or is it raising friends from your funds from your friends and family. And, um, you know, if you uh, went to Cornell Hotel School, for instance, um, then all of the people that you surround yourself with, gosh, that's like quite a network, right? And that that helps you on your way. So what can you do to then help others? That's a little general sounding, but... No, no, I, I I understand what you're saying, um, and I think it's I think it's true. It's just something to worth. Um, I think at least like asking ourselves the question, you know, ask the you know having those comfortable conversations with ourselves. Um, I think is where you have to start, right? And then um, you know having those conversations with others. And I think it's just really about um, being open and being compassionate and being able to listen. So, yeah, I mean. I can tell you a little bit more like, here's what I'm doing. I think that might help. Yeah, like, that, that would be great. So um, my podcast, which I started at, you know, when, when COVID basically hit um, in March, when the hotels that I worked with basically said, oh no, Amy, like we are furloughing our marketing employees. And as our contractor, gosh, you know, we would love to keep you on, but our budget is zero. Mm -hmm. And that was really scary. And it's like, gosh, this is not the time to stop communicating. Like this is the time that we really need to be sending out messages because our database is going to be freaking out, you know, right. um, let's talk, uh, let's tell people that it's going to be okay, that we're going to be okay. And, and we're going to update our property while, you know, while we're away. Um, but how was I going to do that with zero budget? So I started a podcast where I could um, sort of guide um, hotels and and reach more people and be able to share, you know, let's, here's how we can navigate these very tricky times. So it was everything from marketing communications to, you know, how to maybe creatively do a little bit of your own PR. Um and then I started speaking with um, industry experts on certain topics, um, whether it was trends that we're seeing through the pandemic or um, silver linings potentially. And I, so I had that conversation with Damon, um, that was episode 13. And, um, and it sort of, it just struck me. It was like, wow, like I built this podcast to help hotels navigate this time. I also wanted this industry to hear my voice because I felt like women in hospitality were sort of underrepresented. Mm -hmm. And then with Black Lives Matter, it was like, holy cow, it's not just women. And so Damon um, was my guest back in June. And since then I've been able to bring a few more people on um, a hotelier, Monica Lane. Um, she is based in Tucson, Arizona. She came and spoke about um, running a hotel through the pandemic and, and spoke a lot about inclusivity and her personal experiences. And then I had Joey Hamilton join me on a recent episode as well to talk about um, how to make tourism more inclusive and sort of the intersection between tourism in a destination and Black Lives Matter. And it's really, really interesting. So for my part, it's about bringing these voices in and, and passing the mic, you know, um, not trying to speak for them by any means. And that's why some of these questions, I'm get, it's a little bit awkward for me because I'm like, gosh, I wish Damon was here to answer this mm -hmm, for you, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and it is, uh, it's a little tricky. I totally appreciate that you're using your platform to highlight other voices. We have such a similar trajectory in a way. Yeah, I noticed <laughs> that too. Um, I started my podcast this summer in the smack in the middle of the pandemic, but I, you know, I really believe that people who travel, it's like this missing void and to tell stories and to talk about it, I think just really fills in that, that gap. So that was, 
you know, a lot I of love it. Yeah. A lot That's of my great. motivation. And then there was another layer of it with black lives matter movement and just my own personal experience of being a Mexican American woman and just like not seeing myself necessarily represented. And then yeah, all people of color just historically haven't been represented in this industry and seeing it as an opportunity to share as many diverse perspectives as I can. And I love that you have that same mission with your podcast. And so I know it is tricky to ask you these questions because it does kind of put you in the position. I don't mean to put you in the position of speaking for anyone. um, And it's great that you're sharing like what your actions have been. At the same time, I'm kind of like wary of making people of color always have to be the ones answering the questions. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, the other thing is like, can't you just be a person of color and not have to talk about being a person of color? Exactly. And so the people that I've had on who are people of color, I have not asked them anything because I'm like, okay, well, you come with your own expertise um, and I just want you to be seen for that. Um, But those conversations are very important to to have. Um, and I appreciate that you've had those conversations on your show a hundred percent. So it's, it's like this balance, right? Um, so yeah, I just think it's a little yeah. tricky and I'm just trying to like, you know, honor people and like where they're at and you know, what they're comfortable talking about. And I just definitely yeah. appreciate that you're so open to, to talking about this. Cause I think it's really important. And I think you've done you know, a little bit of the work to understand these issues. Gosh, you know, I'm learning a lot and I, I am scared of making a mistake, but I'm also completely aware that I will make mistakes and it will be okay. Um, That's what happens because I don't know. um, I don't know what it feels like. And I, I will never be in those shoes, but I, I can definitely try my damnedest to try to get in those shoes and, um, and understand. And by listening to other people's accounts, I think that's one of the most amazing ways to be able to start to understand and to be empathetic. Absolutely. I'll throw in one more. So Alyssa Ramos was on my show and she, um, is the influencer behind my life's a travel movie. And um, I didn't talk to her at all about the fact that she's a Cuban American. Um, But if you talk to her, that's a big part of her identity. Um, And it could very well just come up in conversation. In our conversation, it didn't come up. It wasn't really the focus of the episode. And so, yeah, that's an example where it's like, I, I just want there to be diverse voices here. I don't actually need to have an agenda about what we talk about. You just need to hear these stories and these accounts. I 100% agree. Okay. So moving forward, looking into 2021. So what do you think will be the top three changes that we see in travel? I know vaccines going to probably heavily, heavily influence that, but yeah. What, what are you seeing? Yes. Let's just take a a moment of silence and wish for a safe (laughs) vaccine to take. (laughs) Oh, man. Um, The vaccine is definitely going to change things. I will say like there is data coming out from the IATA, which is like the basically the airline industry saying, look, we've had over a billion travelers this year and we've only seen this many cases. And they're trying to prove a point here that we have the protocols in place. And now just like you can go stay in a hotel and do so safely, they're saying you can also probably hop on a plane and do so safely. So I think people are going to start to be uh, more willing to travel as we start to see more of those statistics come out. Certainly when there's a vaccine, I think we're all gonna feel a lot more comfortable to hop on a plane again. In terms of other trends that I see in 2021, I think, you know, that adventure travel and ecotourism, I hope that that's going to continue to be really big. So um, even when we do have a vaccine, I think we're sort of now in this habit of traveling to less dense places and traveling off the beaten path. And I think that that will continue. And, um, you know, when we talk about cause-based itineraries, you know, we talked about the Mission District in San Francisco, that's one thing, but there's also the opportunity to get out and do ecotourism all over the world. So um, really get outside of your comfort zone and your bubble, be able to unplug and actually have um, a vacation that leaves you feeling more in touch with, um, 
with the world around you, with nature. I think those are the types of things that people will be seeking out. Um, I had an amazing trip to La Paz, Mexico, right before um, lockdown, like at the very beginning of March. And it really um, kind of blew me away getting to be um, on like an eco tour, getting to swim next to a whale shark and getting to do turtle wow. conservation. Um, with um, some men who were formerly poachers oh, and were um, given this opportunity where they said, you know what, you could actually earn a living and take care of your family if you started saving the turtles instead of killing them. And so they were introduced to conservation and um, it was just sort of um, like right now, as I'm talking to you, I like have chills because that experience, I'd never been that like up close and personal with wildlife. And, mm -hmm. um, we were camping in, you know, nice canvas tents and there was like a chef there, but we were on a sand dune and there were, uh, baby gray whales, like being born beside us that we could then go on a boat and get to experience. And, um, I think people are going to be seeking out trips like that, like trips that are so different from our everyday lives. Um, yeah, I, I could see that being big. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's when you have those experiences, it, like so close to nature, like they're really life-changing. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people, I don't know if, if you're kind of disconnected from nature, but once you have that sort of up close experience, like the one you're talking about, I think you realize yeah, it's just a whole different ball game in a sense. Yeah. And then you come home and you're in your house and you're looking around and it's like, I don't need all of these things, you know, and you're right. in your closet and it's like, you've just lived out of a suitcase and been barefoot for a week. And it's like, I, I'd never been happier. Like I could have just stayed on that sand dune. Uh, and ironically, when we flew home, we flew through the Seattle airport, and got off the plane and we were in like COVID land, like people were dressed oh head to toe PPE and there were signs that said we reserve the right to test you. And it was just a completely different world. It was just, um, that was like March 14th, I think. So it was right wow. when everything changed. And I'm thankful for that we had the chance to go on that trip and we had no idea like on that trip there was just hand sanitizer everywhere remember that time right <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I went um, camping this summer and it was like being in a different world like I had no cell service for like three days and you know wasn't connected to anything it was just out in yeah. nature and it was like to come back into like society was like oh yeah COVID, right? <laughs> it's just so, yeah. such a different reality. And I was literally only like four miles from my house or four hours from my house. So yeah, it's interesting. I think this year, like the highs have been so much higher and the lows have been so much lower. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, okay, so I just found this term, leisure travel. I don't know if you've heard <laughs> of it too, but it's combining yeah. business and le leisure travel um, and that sort of digital nomad um, mm -hmm. experience. And it's expected to become more popular. Do you agree with that? Or, or do you see hotels tapping into to this trend? Yeah, absolutely. Bleasure. Yep, we know it well. Okay. So, <laughs> so the new word, so people are basically like, let's, bleasure is kind of funky, but you'll see things like, and we're rolling them out this fall. It's like workcation, schoolcation. Mm, okay. Um, those are the things that, that a lot of hotels and resorts are talking about now. So, um, amenities that you wouldn't really think of like putting another desk into a hotel room. Like that's something that's happening now so that you can have your time and space to work and do online school. And you're also in a new setting where you can enjoy the hotel pool and have, um, you know, experiences outside of the property, just basically be away from home, but continue your daily life. And then after the work is done, after the school is done, be able to go out and have some fun. So yes, this is big. Um, throughout the end of the year, I think a lot of hotels are trying to really meet the moment. And a lot of people who would like to be traveling right now or are sort of at home and not a great um, situation to be able to work from home, have their kids do online school, they're looking for a bit of an escape where they can sort of have both. 
Right. So Best of both properties, worlds. Are, yeah. So properties are rolling this out. Another thing is like taking the meeting rooms, you know, or um, you know, big conference style um, properties with like big conference halls. They're starting to break those up into little classrooms. So it's like if you are local and you have a tutor and you've got a little pod of five students, you could actually reserve a spot in a hotel and, and you know that you have all the cleaning protocols that come with a hotel and maybe the hotel's throwing in a little, you know, bagels and cream cheese for breakfast or a little afternoon snack, or there's room to run around and have a little bit of recess. So that's what um, we're seeing when it comes to leisure. So it's sort of leisure 2.0, I think. Right, right. Yeah, you're reminding me of, I just saw um, a term, road schooling. Yeah, road yeah, schooling. Yeah, yeah. or Which world is, schooling. That's big. What, what was it? World schooling. World schooling. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm down. I'm for it. <laughs> me too. Yeah, I would like to world school my son. Hopefully not because of the pandemic, but he's two and a half now. And it would be so cool to let him go and experience history instead of just learning it in a textbook, you know, or on a tablet as the case may be. Right, right. Yeah, I spoke with um, a family travel blogger and just the way she spoke about the types of experiences and learning, like real world learning that her kids could do from all the travels that they had done. Um, definitely sounds like it's worth it. You know, just things that you wouldn't get from a tablet, like you're saying, or in a yeah. classroom. Yeah. So do you see an increase in group travel and reunion travel in 2021? I think because a lot of people will want to be reunited with loved ones or friends that they haven't seen in a while. Um, and then if so, are there ways that you see hotels and tour operators helping to create these memorable, meaningful sort of reunions? I think this is brilliant, Kristen. Like, I think <laughs> this is something that we all want. Um, when you said that, I, of course, went to, you know, I thought about my family who's all on the East Coast who I haven't been able to see basically all year. Um, absolutely, people will want to have reunions next year and reunion travel could be really big. Um, I think hotels should and tour operators should capitalize this and start capitalize on this and start thinking about those programs because people try to book those out. Um, as hotels, you know, we've learned that having flexible cancellation policies are key right now. And that's going to continue to be the case. So if hotels can build 2021 um, family reunion packages um, with a bit of a flexible cancellation policy, depending on, you know, everything that we've talked about before this, right. um, I think that could be really big. And it would be so lovely for families to be able to gather in a space that they knew was safe and be able to have um, a reason to celebrate again. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking like, you know, those multiple generations coming together. Um, I think it could be really, really special. Um, yeah. Maybe I should start a travel agency. <laughs> travel for like services. really small, you know, another one, like my property, the property that I work with in Belize, it's 10, um, 10 rooms. I mean, they're, they're cabanas and they're these like freestanding, like jungle type, um, almost like, almost feels like a tree house or something like that. And there, but there's just 10 of them. And then there's um, a pool and there's this open air, like Palapa dining area, but that's the perfect scenario for a buyout for a, for a family right, reunion. Right. So that's something else that hotels that are small enough um, could offer is a full buyout of their property. And then you might see the travelers come sooner if they can actually rent out the entire place and know they have it to themselves. Um, right. Yeah. It's kind of an example of being small, actually being working for you. Yeah. It's good to be small right now. If you're a 300, 400 room property, um, that's a, that's a big challenge right yeah. now. Cause what do you do with all of those teeny tiny rooms, those long hallways, elevators that's not set up for social distancing so I guess you could rent like rent them by fours <laughs> that would maybe be, I don't know <laughs> I'll leave that for someone else to figure out well um, as the traveler what are you going to choose right so yeah yeah what kind of experience do you want and definitely the smaller you know more intimate experience 
And then, so do you see any international destinations becoming popular in, tw in 2021? I guess, say, if we do get a vaccine? I think just like going back to that adventure travel, I think places that are feel a little bit more off the beaten path, you know, Belize just reopened. Um, that might be a place that people are, are going to be willing to go to. Um, it's relatively close, especially if you live on the East Coast. Um, it's not international, but Hawaii is opening up um, now as well, I think as of October 15th. Hopefully mm -hmm. that date doesn't get pushed. Um, and that so feels I think, sort of international, right? It's just so different. Yeah, it feels, yeah, it does. Tropical, I, think people, at least. I think people will jump to head there because they can't go further. Right. Um, and also because it's Hawaii, obviously. Hawaii is amazing. Right. Um, it's hard to talk about international travel with the borders closed. I know, Mexico, it just seems so far off. Yeah, I mean, Mexico, people are traveling down there right now, and um, you see a variety of things like Tulum looks, um, there's parts of it that look pretty touristy and not really great for social distancing. Then I look at a place like La Paz that I was just saying, I was just down there, um, and even like Loreto and Baja California, like those areas are pretty amazing, and I would definitely go back there. I would book a ticket um, today if I if I could and go down there, I could technically book a ticket today. It's just right. my, we can't yet. <laughs> and then do you see people sharing their travel experiences less or more on social media? Oh, I want to ask you this question. <laughs> so are you asking, are people sort of like going places and maybe scared to share it right now? Yeah, I guess that's sort of what I've been seeing and, and reading is that people may share their experiences less because of fear of judgment or just because, I don't know, this, that their values have changed and it's not so important to sort of broadcast every um, place that mm. they've been. It sounds like, I mean, that's, it's a combination of those things. I do think like when you talk about travel influencers, I think there's a, an opportunity with hotels and destinations reopening for those properties, um, sorry, for hotels and destinations to lean on travel influencers to come out and have some of the first experiences um, in an area that's been reopened so that they can then share it. I think when people are traveling right now, it is really smart to say, hey, this was our experience because we're all like, our ears are open. We want to know. I want every time somebody gets on a plane, I'm like, how was it? What right. was it like? You know, did, you know, was, did anybody cough? <laughs> you know, right. Like, like, did you feel safe is really what we were trying yeah, to say. We want right? to know if people feel safe. We want to know if the places that they went, it felt like um, the rules were being followed and it, that also that it still felt like a vacation because we don't want to travel somewhere and feel like um, we're under lockdown when we arrive. Sure. Yeah. You, you want to have that. You want to feel like you have the freedom for that feeling of freedom, I think is a big part of going on vacation. Right. So you don't want to feel constricted, you know, while you're out trying to enjoy yourself. What are some buzzwords that we'll be hearing in 2021 around travel? Oh, this is a good question. Um, I think we talked about road schooling. Yeah. <laughs> world schooling. World schooling, road schooling, um, leisure. Um, I have one that like I want to throw out there and it's woke travelers. So it's travelers that are, yeah, like they are aware of what's happening and they're looking for communities and destinations and hotels that are... Um, are also speaking up for what they believe in, right? So I think woke travelers, people who want to um, have those authentic experiences that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, we can replace can authentic with like genuine. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, yeah. I think unfortunately- deeper, Or just deeper experiences Yeah, deeper, maybe. I like that. Yeah, meaningful yes, let's experiences. let's throw away the word authentic in 2021. How about that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which I used to love that word. It's just needs a little break and then we'll, we'll it'll come back around. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we'll still hear a lot of the word social distancing. It's it's just 
um, it's still going to be important. And even when we have the vaccine, um, like I'm saying, I think adventure travel and ecotourism are going to be big because they tend to be remote and you're not in crowded areas. Right. What advice would you give someone who is hesitant to plan a trip for next year? Where should they start? Should they, what should they look for when they're booking? Yeah. I mean, uh, I would say start planning. Gosh, it feels good even just to like op- crack open a guidebook or start looking on Pinterest. I think you can start uh, planning because there are there's starting to be a proliferation of information about social distancing in insert destination. So you can actually get those resources and and really understand what you're going to get, not just um, the tours and experiences that you can have, but how social distancing fits into all of that. And once you know that, I think you should feel pretty good about booking. Um, You can also get on the phone. You don't have to book online. I would say book directly with whatever hotel you want to stay with or vacation rental. Um, When you book direct, you'll have a more flexible cancellation policy and an easier time if something does happen and you need to cancel your trip. Perfect. So I want to know if you can tell me about a travel experience that brought you the most joy. So the experience that brought me the most joy, you know, I touched on it earlier, but it really was that trip to La Paz, Mexico. Um, It really pushed me to my limits. Uh, We were completely unplugged. We had no Wi-Fi. We're staying on this sand dune um, off of the Pacific Ocean where these mama gray whales and their babies are swimming. And we got to interact with them. And interestingly enough, the gray whale, the baby gray whales were so curious that they would come right up to our boat. And this was an eco adventure. Everything was um, very carefully and um, thoughtfully planned. So we were not interrupting their habitat, anything like that. Um, So half of the trip was gray whales. The other half of the trip was turtle conservation. And we got to hear from these men who were former poachers who had learned that they could actually earn a living um, by saving the turtles instead of killing them. Um, They used to go out at midnight and find turtles because it was illegal and they could end up in jail and now their lives look very different so um, it really was this incredible experience led by locals in La Paz Um, female biologists were our tour guides that were studying at the university there Um, it was absolutely unbelievable and um, yeah that it it really was life-changing whether or not I walked back into a pandemic um, it really did change the way that I will travel in the future. That sounds like an amazing experience. And I'm so glad that you ha- you got to have that right before everything sort of went crazy. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Well, Amy, thank you so much for chatting with me. I really enjoyed our conversation. I really enjoyed it too. Thank you, Kristen. I hope you enjoyed the show. The best place to find out more about Amy is by visiting her website, amydreheim.com. That's A-M-Y-D-R-A-H-E-I-M.com. And you can follow her on Instagram at at Amy Dreheim and on Pinterest and Facebook at at Amy Dreheim blog. And she's also the host of her own podcast, How to Share. And you can check that out as well by going to her website. And I've included links to all these places in the show notes. And just a reminder that the Explore and You store is open. Just go to exploreandyou.com forward slash shop. And if you buy a shirt, a hoodie, a tote, I'd love to see it. So take a picture of yourself and post it to Instagram or Facebook and tag me at at Explorer and you and I'll make sure to share it. Okay, have a great week, everyone. Stay healthy and safe. Thanks for listening to the Explorer and You podcast. Don't worry, we have a new episode every week. Subscribe so you don't miss it. And don't forget to visit explorerandyou.com for more inspiration and tips. If you want to share the love, you're welcome to send this podcast to others. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.